Just Energy with naturopath and medical intuitive Dr. Rita Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theories that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating. From the swing of a pendulum to the waves in the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day, each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. In the same way, things such as rocks and minerals vibrate very slowly and at speeds that are imperceptible to us. Living things such as plants, animals, and man vibrate faster and appear to be alive. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is if we take everything in our own universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita as she explores questions such as, what are we made of? Why do we get sick? How can I live a more balanced and whole life? Call in and talk to her and her thought-provoking guests. Send us your questions and get the help you need to move beyond any obstacles or challenges that may be affecting your life, right from the source. So stay tuned and explore your possibility. Hello and welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm Dr. Rita Louise. Thank you all for tuning into the show today. Oh my God, what an exciting show. We're going to be talking about karma and reincarnation and whether you know we really do come back and have to pay the price of the maybe bad things. Not that I do bad things ever, but that happen in life. Well, we're going to find out all about that. But let me just give you a couple of little reminders. Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com and the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com, where you can learn to become a energy medicine practitioner, intuitive counselor, or medical intuitive. Just Energy Radio is broadcast on Blog Talk Radio. It's also broadcast live on Fate Radio. You can catch uh, episodes of Just Energy Radio on iTunes as well as YouTube. That's a new avenue we have been um, exploring. So, oh, and then also, if you uh, go to the Just Energy Radio website, that's justenergyradio.com, in addition to having all of our archives, which there's over four years' worth of archives, you can sign up for our newsletter and find out who's coming up on the show every week. Okay, so with all of that out of the way, let me introduce our guest today because we have so much to talk about. You know how I am with my list, and I have two pages of questions here. So <laughs> lots to talk about. So today we're going to be talking to Barbara Martin and Dimitri Moritis. Okay, I need to ask him how to pronounce that name, and I did not ask him before uh, we came on air. Uh, Having been called the Mozart of metaphysics, Barbara Martin is considered one of the foremost clairvoyant and metaphysical teachers working today. Barbara has been at the forefront of the metaphysical New Age movement for over 40 years. Dimitri, Dimitri Moratis, Moratis, sorry Dimitri, don't hate me for that, is co-founder and executive director of Spiritual Arts Institute. Dimitri has been instrumental in organizing the teaching material and bringing Spiritual Arts Institute to the place it is today as one of the leading metaphysical schools in the country. Together, they have authored the books, Karma and Reincarnation, Unlocking Your 800 Lives to Enlightenment, The Healing Power of Your Aura, and Changing Your, Change Your Aura, Change Your Life. So please welcome to Just Energy Radio, Barbara Martin and Dimitri. See, I'm just going to totally avoid that, Dimitri. Please say your last name for me. <laughs> but you said it right, Moritis. <laughs> Moritis. Well, you know, I have no phonic skills. My listeners totally know I have, like, zero phonic skills. And I have trashed the best of them. So welcome to the club. And I just Thank get you. so hesitant to... Uh, Screw up. Well, we're it's happy to kind be of here. embarrassing. Yeah, I am so excited to have you guys here. Thank um, you. I, I loved your book. I think it is one of the most informative books I've seen about the topics of karma and reincarnation that have come out of, and I'm going to say, a, a Western author. Right. You know, yes. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of India, but, you know, most people go, oh. illusion, let go of the illusion. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> right. 
and that was one of the purposes of writing the book, to try and make something very comprehensible and accessible and usable, because this, these are laws that are active in our life right now. So it's not just realizing they're there. We have to actually learn how to work with them. So that was one how of the things. How did you guys... Go ahead, I'm sorry. How did you guys get into this whole business of karma and reincarnation in the first place? Well, it led up to it because metaphysics has so many uh, uh, parts of it that are interesting, and we felt that this was one of the most interesting. Right. Uh, after the aura books, this seemed like the next inevitable step, and based on Barbara's years of experience with it, that's another thing that was unusual about the book. It was based on her own clairvoyant experiences of the reincarnation process and all of that that felt it was the time to talk about it. And it was kind of, uh, as you were saying, kind of uh, under-presented in the market. We would do lectures on it, and people really didn't understand it, or if they thought they understood it, it was in a very kind of vague way. So we realized, you know, we better, it's time to really kind of set the record straight, so to speak. So that was the impetus for, for writing the book. And it was very and interesting. I Go ahead. Every I'm time you write a new book, as you know, it's, there's something new you discover in the process, and it just was an amazing experience. Yeah. It's, uh, I just think it's an interesting topic. It is an interesting topic, and it's not a topic that's real accessible well, no. No. Um, on a personal level unless you have some training or some skill or you work with someone that – deals with past lives and that whole process and cycle. Yeah, well, well if you have, uh, if you're into metaphysics, then eventually you're going to get to this topic. And you have to. You know, it's a, it, you can't climb the spiritual ladder without coming to terms with the, our karma. It just yeah. can't, won't happen. So it's, a, it's really, I think, maybe a, a top, topic that's brought, come to its turn and as you say, it's, it's not easy finding the right ways to work with it. But actually, as hopefully we'll be getting into, there's a lot of signposts in our lives right now indicating what's going on with us, the connection to past lives. Right. We don't need to have mm -hmm. a direct mystical connection to have that sense and feeling of things and to start applying the principles in our life. You know, the, the thing, many of the things that happen in our life have a karmic element. Not all of them, but many of the things do. So understanding that karmic element gives us a better handle on how to deal with those situations. Right, right. Well, maybe a good place to start is to just define, you know, kind of in a general sense, um, what we're really talking about. What is karma and what, I, I think people have a fair idea about reincarnation, but karma in particular. But define both of them so that it creates kind of a, a baseline for us to build on. Well, of course, uh, reincarnation is the process of re-embodiment. And it means, uh, first of all, it implies that this, the body is, is not where the source of life is. There is a soul inhabiting the body. And it goes through a process of successive embodiments in physical form to learn to experience the variety of life and to grow. So, uh, in other words, we are going through a process of evolution and no matter how brilliant we are in a single lifetime or how successful we are, there's no way on earth you can even come close to experiencing life in all of its varieties. So we come back many times, like grades in a school, uh, getting better and better, stronger and stronger, ascending and ascending, till finally we do reach that state of spiritual maturity. So uh, it's not an endless loop of incarnations. It's a, it's a certain... Uh, spiral of evolution of, of incarnations leading to a particular point now uh, karma is of course that Sanskrit word and it simply means in its most basic form action it means action so in other words but however we have expanded that definition to include action and its effect so we take some type of action mental emotional physical whatever it is and based on that action, there will be a corresponding effect what goes around comes around. And that whole process we call karma. So karma is uh, its not a, a reward or a punishment. It's just a basic law of life 
that as we've impressed the fabric of life, we receive back as we've put it out. If we've impressed it with things that are cooperating with the, the, the harmony of life, we receive back that harmony multiplied. If we put out something that creates discord and tensions and goes against the natural flow of life, then we will feel that natural tension and discord until we can bring karma, the, the life back into harmony because karma is also a harmonizing law. It's trying to bring back life into greater balance. So whether it, depending what our actions have been, we're going to feel the effects. Sometimes we'll feel it in this life, but more often than not, we feel it the effects from past lives. And I remember when uh, uh, years ago I was learning this, and um, I've been studying with Barbara now many, many years, and it was an eye-opener to realize that, you know, this whole experience in our life, this incarnation, is just one chapter in a much, much larger cosmic story of who we are. And slowly we have to kind of step back and say, well, let's try to get a sense of where that was, what brought us to this point. Everything you possess right now, your talents, your character traits, your strengths, your weaknesses, uh, they've all been accumulated from many incarnations building up to where we are now. We didn't just start with a blank slate and then everything came up from childhood. We, we see that even with children. From the immediate moment they're born, they're showing certain inclinations because the soul is carrying that quality in from previous experiences. So we've created our past, we're creating our present, and the things we're doing now are going to be creating our future. One of the things you said was that, especially with the reincarnation, was that we were spir you know, spiraling around and evolving. Mm -hmm. Do people experience, and I'm going to say lifetimes, where they actually spiral downward? You know, oh, can yeah. people get on that track and spiral downward for a while and then, you know, finally clear whatever it is they're holding on to and start back up the evolutionary spiral? Well, absolutely. That's the, that's the way it plays out in reality. Uh, it'd be nice if every lifetime was better than the one before, but in reality it doesn't quite work that way. Again, we need to think of, of Earth as a school. We come here to learn and grow. Sometimes we learn the lessons and sometimes we goof them up. So we may have lifetimes where we do absolutely magnificent things. Maybe we learn how to use money really well and we amass an enormous amount of money through our good intentions and all the things we do. So we accrue all this good karma and all this good energy. Well, the next lifetime we come in and we're born maybe into a family of billionaires because of that good karma that we earned. However, we don't remember <laughs> what we did, how hard we worked to earn that good fortune. And in this lifetime, we mess it up. We misuse our money, we squander it, you know, and then, yes, we lose ground. So it's true, if you look at the full arc of your incarnations, from your very first step in clay feet to the time you're truly ready for the heaven worlds, uh, you'll notice it'll probably look more like a stock market graph. It's going to go up and down, but the overall arc is definitely upward. Until finally at the end the soul says, enough, I get this already, and it completely stays on the track until it reaches the full maturity. So it's a gradual, as you know from our book, the subtitle is 800 Lives, Unlocking Your 800 Lives to Enlightenment. Now that's not a fixed number, but it's a number that uh, the Holy Ones teach of a general process it takes to get to that level. And those lives include the lives of mistakes and the lives of tremendous uh, successes. Well, and with 800, it also gives you the impression that <laughs> it's more than one or two. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, okay, we got to change our, our perspective. I know it's, it's not that long ago we thought the Earth was 6,000 years old and we were 6,000 years old. We now realize, you know, the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. Humanity stretches much further back in time than we ever imagined. So we have changed our paradigm of how just the universe physically operates. Well, of course, there has to be a corresponding effect spiritually. 
because the physical world is a result of spiritual activity. It's an end result. So there was a spiritual world long before there was a physical one. And our soul existed long before we ever had a physical body. So, yeah, we, again, and, and it does sound like a lot, but then when you compare it to eternity, it doesn't really sound that much. <laughs> and, you know, the Bible says, with long life will I satisfy God and show him my salvation. So we have to do take the long view, and I, I like what uh, Henry Ford said on that. He was saying when I adopted the theory of reincarnation, it gave me this tremendous sense of relief because I realized there was time to create. And if you keep a, a record of this conversation, write it so it puts men's minds at ease. The calmness that the long view of life has. So the, the joy of this is that we're always given a second chance. Of course, take care of the things you need to do right now. Don't dilly-dally. But life is this beautiful glorious unfolding process and it, it, it's kind of an eternal process that's going on in different types of phases, different types of areas of experience so the, the life on earth I mean we look back, people are saying you know, and they're looking back on their life my god it went by so fast you know, when we're going through it it seems like a long time but when we look back on our life it seems like a, you know, a drop and we realize in the larger scheme it is just an episode of a much more larger picture. Has, from your experience, and, and maybe this is a question directed to Barbara, ha, have you experienced people having lifetimes um, that extend outside the the Earth, or and I'm not even going to say, that, you know, our universe, I mean, because we know how old it is, you know, we know how old the Earth is. Um, right. Have people experienced lifetimes that extend beyond that? Yes, yes, that happens. But generally we focus here because Earth is, especially physical Earth, is the schoolhouse. So later on we may go to other schoolhouses, you know, but just like we generally tend to stay, you know, at the same high school or at the same college that we started from, the same would be true here. And that also ties in, by the way, to the karma, because as we accrue the karma on Earth, we definitely have to come back to Earth to work it out. We, we can't work it out somewhere else. We have to go back to the place where we, where we generated it, right. so to speak. So that would explain... I mean, it's kind of interesting. That would explain why, like, when I'm working with some clients, not a lot, but every so often I'll just get the feeling that they've only really incarnated here a few times. You know, they don't have a lot of experience being, I'm going to say, on Earth, and I always get the feeling that they had incarnated somewhere else, and it's kind of like they've either finished their work there or they're like a transfer student. <laughs> <laughs> who's come to this school to learn a different set of lessons. Right. Well, that, that can happen, but it's pretty rare. It, it's pretty it is rare, rare. but I've, yeah. I've seen yeah. it. Okay, good. Yeah, it's, but again, we, we, we have to, as you said, change our point of view that really 800 lives is not that long from the eternal point of view. <laughs> so, uh, and when we also, they, they get divided up. Um, they're not all the same style as, as the book was showing. The first 100 lives or, or 200 lives or so are the instinctual lives. This is where we live more like a caveman or gatherers and hunters, period, uh, where we're kind of working out of our – we're still – we're human. We're not animals, but we're more in an instinctual consciousness. Then when we finally mature out of that, we get the, the intellectual levels where we build up the power of our mind – where we really express free choice. That's the levels that allowed us to build civilizations, the arts, the sciences. All that came out of a, a mind awareness, a mind awakening. And, of course, that's where the accountability also came in because now we had free choice. We could choose to act one way or another because we had that awareness of how to do that. And the bulk of our incarnations happened there, the 500 lives. And that's because, again, up to that point, humanity kind of worked very close together because there really wasn't that much diversion. But after that, people really went 
more in different directions because they realize they have the choice to do that. Uh, eventually, though, the soul cries out. As after it goes through so many earth experiences, it tries for every pleasure, it experiences many pains, it has ambitions, it, but more talking about more material-minded, uh, it realizes, well, I've tried everything and still I'm not satisfied. There's still something more. This can't be all there is to life. And that's where the spiritual awakening happens. So at that point, you enter into a phase of what the higher calls the hundred lifetimes of enlightenment. It's not one. There's a whole process of awakening the soul to its full conscious awareness of the connection with the inner worlds. And that that's a beautiful, gradual process. And of course, there's some of the most enjoyable lives because uh, this is where we really get to express our unique talents and you know, in ways where we have, you know, we're like our geniuses and things like that start to come at that point. And all the mysteries of life, they suddenly, what seemed incomprehensible is now beginning to be understandable. And we realize, uh, you know, we weren't thrown blindly on this earth. You know, there's a divine plan. We're part of God. We're part of a, an amazing process of life. And we start to claim that inheritance. And that leads up to the final maturity levels. And from then, you enter into, you truly enter into the heaven worlds. You know, where a lot of uh, traditions will say, well, you go to heaven by being a good boy or good girl, you know, in your life. Well, metaphysics would say, well, you actually grow to heaven from many incarnations through a gradual process of earning your way. Think of it like, uh, you know, if the heaven worlds are filled with, you know, hundreds of thousands of watts of power, and we've still got maybe you know, tens of thousands, or we don't have enough to go there. We have to keep building more power so we can earn those spiritual ranks. Yes, that's true. Yeah. That's the way that works. Yeah. So, there's so kind of silly. Oh. Go ahead, Barbara. No, I was just saying there's a lot to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. And you kind of answered this before, but does everybody come back time after time, or is it just certain people that come back no. time after no, everyone, time? Everyone. No, everyone. Yeah. Everyone. That's why the Indians called it the cycle of necessity. It's not a choice. We have to come. I know that's a big question. It's funny you're saying that because a lot of the lectures will go, that's it. This is my last life. I'm not coming back again. <laughs> I've had it with this place. I'm anywhere but here, you know. And it's usually said, of course, with a sense of frustration. And the point we got to remember is there's absolutely nothing wrong with coming back to Earth. It's a perfectly natural process. We've all done it hundreds of times. And it's the only way to evolve. Right. But when it does get frustrating, and this is the part I think is worth exploring a little bit, is when we don't finish what we came to this earth to do and we leave the earth with unfinished business then it gets frustrating so in other words there's no no matter what we experience in life and the many varieties of experiences there is absolutely no greater satisfaction than to know we finished our purpose the reason god put us on this earth right and unfortunately probably no greater sense of frustration no matter what else we accomplish, knowing that we didn't do it. And the higher has basically indicated that about half the time we don't get it done. It's almost a coin toss. And this is not because we weren't given the talent or the ability or the awareness. It's because we let other things get in the way. Distractions, whatever you want to call it, we don't focus on what we need to do, and those are the reasons. Because when we're shown, as you read from the book, before we come to Earth, we're shown this magnificent tapestry of life, which has the major events of our life already already in the, in the vision. And it's like a mission. We come to this Earth to weave that tapestry, to actually make it happen. And unfortunately, some of the times we just don't get it done. So this is what we're urging, is to pay attention to the things that are in your life. Because these are not just accidentally falling in there. There's a reason these things are there. And you have to look at the bigger picture because you want to get that done. You want to get that finished. You know, when we finish this life, we're taken to the astral planes. 
and the Holy Ones show us our book of life. And they show us the things that we've accomplished and not the subjective memory of our own subconscious. You know, let's say right now, if I remember an event when I was five years old, I'm remembering it through the mind of a five-year-old because that's the way it was put into the subconscious. But in the book of life, I'm remembering it objectively. I'm not remembering it, I'm seeing it objectively, almost like the way God recorded it. And we see our true intentions. We see what was really motivating us, the real effects on other people. It's a very powerful experience and sometimes a little challenging. But it's to show us, you know, here, look, you finish this, you finish that, uh-oh, this is left undone. You see, this is part, you'll have to go back and take care of this. So they're very adamant about showing what was left undone because they want us to get it finished. Their goal is to make sure we get it all done. And what we came to this earth to do, we get finished. So the best thing that could ever happen when we finish this life and meet the higher and all the wonderful things that happen on the other side is they say to us, you know, job well done. You got it done. And I think there are so many people that, you know, especially people that are on their spiritual path that get frustrated because they don't know what they're supposed to do. And I think a little bit later on, maybe you can give some advice as to how to tap into that, you know, get a better sense of what that is. But I just feel like they realize they're here to do something, but they don't know what it is, and so they flounder around or don't trust that what they're doing is the right thing. I know you hear that all the time. They're looking for the pur- their purpose in life all the time. And the thing to remember is every single person on earth has a purpose. No one is put on this earth without reason. So it's not if there's a purpose. It's, as you say, trying to understand that purpose. And we're also shown that purpose before we come to earth. So it's not a mystery to us. It's just when we get submerged in physical form, a lot of that gets submerged with it. But you notice not for everybody. Some people at a very young age, they know exactly what they want to do. Mm -hmm. There's no question whatsoever. So the real question is then, why am I not tuning into my purpose? Not if I, why do I have a, do I have a purpose? The question is, I know I do. But why am I not aware of it? Why am I not tuning into it? If it's already been shown to me, if it's in my auric field, if the higher is already working with me to make it happen, Mm-hmm. And all this beautiful support system is around me, so we have to look more at ourselves here. Now, karma can't fit into this picture, by the way. For example, and this is one of the stories in the book, let's say uh, I have a wonderful opportunity at a career in a life, and I have all the privilege, all the everything is there, money, every, all the resources to be really successful at it are there, but I mess it up. I live the life of Riley, I dilly-dally, I don't pursue what I'm supposed to do, time passes by, and before you know it, some of those golden opportunities are gone. And I end up that life very unfulfilled. Now, what's going to happen in the next life? Well, it depends largely on my attitude as I was finishing the previous life. For example, if I didn't get it that I just messed it up, you know, I was the playboy, I was this, that, I just fooled around too much and wasn't serious, then, of course, by the end of my life, I'm probably going to be a little bitter. I'm going to say life sucks, you know, or I'm going to blame people in other situations for not getting it, you know, things not working out the way. I'll realize I missed an opportunity, but I won't quite realize why I missed it because I hadn't really done enough self-examination. So I will leave that life confused. Now, when I come back to work it out, I'm not suddenly going to have necessarily the full vision of what to do. I will come back with that same confusion. And I will have to now work very hard and maybe struggle through things for years to reawaken the purpose that's already inside of me. And through that experience, the soul will learn the extremely valuable lesson. When the opportunity is present, you take it. This is God talking to you. Don't mess it up. Now, in the same way, let's say I had that golden opportunity. Excellent.
see, there's the music, which means we need to take a quick break. But let's, let's come back to that topic on the other side. I'm Dr. Rita Louise. We're here talking to Barbara Martin and Dimitri Moratis. To Ed Dimitri, their book is Karma and Reincarnation, Unlocking Your 800 Life of Enlightenment. And we'll be back after these messages. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. I'm Dr. Rita Louise, the founder of the Institute of Applied Energetics. Start a new career today on the leading edge of alternative health and healing. The Institute of Applied Energetics can help you to develop the specialized skills you'll need to work as an energy medicine practitioner, intuitive counselor, or professional medical intuitive. Besides our outstanding technical instruction, Our programs also support you in creating and building a successful business in this rapidly growing field. Be a catalyst for changing the way healthcare is done around the world. Contact the Institute of Applied Energetics right away or visit AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com. Balance in all things is critical to maintaining health. In the hectic drive of today's world, many of us forget to take care of our most important asset, ourselves. At ProductForTheSoul.com, we want to support your effort to nurture yourself. We offer a wide variety of herbs, supplements, and high-quality, ready-to-eat, all-natural foods. We even offer holographic chip technology products that can augment the body's natural ability to increase energy, improve sleep, and mitigate pain. Best of all, all of our products are delivered straight to your door. It's time to start loving yourself. Visit productsforthesoul.com and let us help you along the way. Back to Just Energy Radio with Dr. Rita Louise. Hello and welcome back to Just Energy Radio. I'm Dr. Rita Louise and we're talking with Barbara Martin and Dimitri Moritis um, about their book, Karma and Reincarnation. Their website is www. SpiritualArts.org. That's SpiritualArts.org. Dimitri and Barbara, before the break, we were talking about discovering our life purpose and how, how can somebody do that? I mean, I, and I'll just use myself as an example. I mean, I've always been kind of a self-directed, weird person. You know, I used to read archaeology books in elementary school and, you know, you know, <laughs> have always kind of been on this path. Started on my spiritual path when I was 12. I mean, I've always been on this path that has not really gone with the mainstream. <laughs> Oops. Um, and so I feel, I'm, especially at this point in time, that if I pass tomorrow, maybe I didn't get all my work done, but I've gotten something done. And so I feel pretty good about that. Right. Good. Um but I'm, I'm not everybody, and everybody doesn't operate that way. Is there anything people can do? Or you can, you, you know, you mentioned something about following the things that are falling into our lives. And I'm just wondering, since we're kind of on that whole life purpose thing, if we can just explore that a little bit more. I think that is so important. Well, um, first of all, you notice what you did as a child. You, even though it was not the norm, some of the things you did, you did them anyway. So you you listened to your heart and you just did what came to you. So this is one of the first keys. You know, we're, we're not in the cookie-cutter mold, all of us, so we do need to follow what's in kind of our hearts, 
even if it doesn't go to the drumbeat of what it was meant to do. Uh, in my own case, I originally followed a creative path. I was going in the in the film business, and uh, uh, that, uh, interestingly enough, led me into the spiritual. You wouldn't think maybe that was two would be directly connected, but in my case, they were. But by following my heart, it led me to where I needed to go. So that's a very important tool uh, to do that. Now, also, it's very interesting as we were working on the book, um, one of the things to keep in mind is that your spiritual purpose is different from your spiritual potential or your uh, your purpose in life. In other words, your purpose in life is how you're serving the divine plan. If the plan is to build a cathedral, well, somebody's got to be the bricklayer, somebody's got to be the architect, someone's got to do the stained glass windows. We each have jobs to do, and it's all serving a kind of a common purpose, and that's part of our purpose. But our potential is how far can we climb in the spiritual ladder in a single life. In other words, right now, each of us has a spiritual potential, a certain level of spiritual maturity we can hit right now in this life, not 20 lifetimes from now. And you can think of that that almost like a talent. You know, if I have a talent to be a, a concert pianist, but I'm only playing at mid-level, well, I have to keep harnessing and building my talent until I get it to that concert level. And that's what happens. Now, some people make the mistake, especially spiritually-minded people. They have the, their awakening, and it's, of course, an ecstatic experience, and the light bulbs go on, and we realize there is a greater purpose to life, and things just start becoming somehow more magical. And somehow we may make the mistake of thinking, well, that's my purpose. My purpose is just to, to evolve. Well, of course your purpose, I mean, you're here to evolve, but it doesn't mean that the things you have to do as part of your purpose have to have the word spiritual in it. It just means that you're going to take that spiritual power and apply it to other things that you are doing. Because remember, regardless of what you do, you take your light with you wherever you go. It is true, some of us are meant to become spiritual teachers. And then, in a sense, the spiritual does become our purpose. But for other people, their purpose is to be an extraordinary lawyer, an extraordinary doctor, an extraordinary accountant, an extraordinary business person. And those are just as much a part of the divine plan as, quote-unquote, being a teacher or an instructor or something of that nature. So one of the things in understanding purpose, especially since we're talking to an audience here that's very spiritually minded, is to keep these two kind of, they're like tracks, they kind of run together parallel, but they're not the same thing. And it's a process. As you're evolving your soul, you're completing your purpose. And it works together. So like you said, maybe right now we haven't accomplished everything, but certainly some things, yes. And I'm sure that's completely the case. But we keep working at it until, of course, we hit the pinnacle and we do everything we need to do. Notice even stories like with the Buddha. You know, he left his wealthy surroundings, went to pursue truth and enlightenment. But it wasn't until after he reached the full enlightenment that his actual mission began, not before. So we have to hit that pinnacle, and then our, our service is really fully processed. So really understanding things like karma and reincarnation and all these things and spiritual development... Those are all metaphysical things, are tools to reach your spiritual potential so then you can go out and apply it in your purpose. Now, as far as understanding purpose, if there is confusion, then of course there's a lesson. It means something, uh, uh, if, if, if this was given by God and it's already in you and it's a part of you and it's bringing out the best in you, if it's not clear, then somewhere there, there is a lesson that needs to be looked at. What do they say? Confusion is the beginning of understanding. So what we often recommend, well, a couple things here. Number one, you kind of want to level the playing field. As you're looking at your different potentials and opportunities in your life, rather than start saying things like, oh, no, I can't do this, or no, that's too expensive, I can't go back to school again, are you crazy? All the things that we set up for ourselves that stop us before we even get started, kind of put all of those things aside and just say, if everything were equal right now, what would I be doing that would best serve 
the higher purpose of life. And that will start to get the ball rolling. Now, another thing is we do have that wonderful higher self. That it's in, and Barbara sees it as that beautiful point of light 24 inches above the head. And that is the, the connection to the higher part of you that's already in touch with what you need to do. And we do whole workshops on this, just trying to get in touch with the higher to understand how it works putting kind of almost like ourselves out of the way, going again to that higher nature, almost like going to the altar of God and saying, God, reveal to me that which I need and that which I need to know now. And if we really have an open heart, we will get impressions. Now, it's very interesting. When we do these exercises often in classes, and then at first we'll say, well, what did you get? Did you get anything or not? And uh, many will say, no, not really. Then we'll question it a little bit further and go, oh, yes, they definitely got something. But it wasn't what they thought it was or what they wanted to hear, so they disregarded it. A lot of mistakes people are making is they're thinking the purpose will come in a giant sign in the sky, neon lit, and it'll be undeniable. Well, once in a while that can happen, but more often than not, it's as the ancients say, it's the still, small voice within. So the higher hardly ever gives us the full plan, just lays it, I mean, when we're in this once we're engaged in the life, beforehand they do, they give us the next step. So if you're suddenly impressed to go do something in this direction, pursue it. See, we often don't trust our own intuition. We doubt ourselves, and that doubting sets up an interference, it makes things more clouded, more, more vague, and instead of just getting out there and trying it, we don't do anything. You know, uh, if you really gave it a good shot, right or wrong, you've learned. You're the better for it. If it was not the right thing, just don't do it again. If it was, you know you're on the right track. So the only real sin, not sin, but the one mistake we make is not trying, is not going out there and applying, having that confidence, feeling, okay, I may not know exactly my purpose right now, but you know what? I'm pursuing it with all of my heart. And I'm doing all the things that I feel and I trust in the process of life that that will lead me to where I need to be. Now, there is one other thing we can include here. And this is, you know, again, the Indians have a wonderful school uh, called Karma Yoga, which is the law of right action. And this is teaching to kind of, in a sense, you know, definitely make your plans for the future, but work, put the work at the that's in front of you. In other words, work without attachment. Work for the pleasure of the work that's in front of you right now. And this is the key that will take you to the next step because God doesn't actually live in the future. God doesn't live in the past. God lives only in the present. So we do have to be in that present even though we bless the past because it brought us to this point. We plan to the future because there's our destiny, but we have to live right now and through that living we will be guided because we're not doing this alone the higher is working with us but we have to make the effort to reach into the higher so that will help in terms of understanding purpose and and it's a process you know eventually it will become more and more clear but we, we have to be tenacious with it we can't say oh I'm really motivated today but then tomorrow you know I could care you know it's uh, I, I, I could care less. So um, it has to be a very steady kind of a thing that we have to do. And that will lead us to where we need to go. We do recommend meditation daily with our all our classes and workshops. We do what are called meditative prayers. Every you know We recommend doing it every single day. Meditating is your time to receive from God. Prayer is your time to petition. And that circuit keeps you in tune with the divine. Many times we get so lost in the woods, we don't take the time to just stop and feel the divine presence. And that will get us back to our center. It doesn't matter how off course we are. Once we get the light bulb going, it will redirect us like a spiritual compass exactly where we need to go. So that's mainly some of the keys. Um, and, of course, you know, we've been talking about karma, that can come into the picture. Sometimes there are karmic elements like we were talking before the break. And, and let's hold off on, on that. To, I want to 
stay on this topic just for a minute more. And then we, because first, I have two things. First, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing with people that it's okay and maybe your path is to be a great lawyer, to be a great mom or dad, to be a great support system or networker for people or whatever it is that you do. There are so many people that feel like, oh, I'm supposed to be sitting on a mountain meditating or I'm supposed to be doing healing work or doing readings and they get frustrated with themselves. And, you know, I mean, I believe everybody has gifts, but eh, not, you know, they're all not the same. And maybe it's better that you're that great lawyer (laughs) that has a little bit of intuition that you tie in and kind of work on that on the side as opposed to not being a great lawyer or great mom and doing that as a hobby and work on developing that as you move through this life. Absolutely, absolutely. The light needs to go to all phases of society, and it can only go by people in those positions, and it's in every field of endeavor. An enlightened scientist, an enlightened politician, these are, I mean, imagine the possibilities. So absolutely, it needs to go everywhere into all the fabric of life. And that also makes it more fun. I mean, if we had a, a planet of counselors, there'd be nobody to counsel, you know. <laughs> <It's all because. laughs> so, so, again, we have to be a little uh, careful there, like you said. But I've never heard someone make that statement. And I'm just oh, wow. so glad that you have just put it out there. This is how it is. So I very much appreciate that. Um, kind of tied to what you were saying um, is the whole concept of surrendering. People hate that word. I love that word. But the concept of surrendering and just opening opening yourself up to receiving that guidance and going, I, I joke around, I argue with my higher self or God or whoever, and it's like, well, do I really have to do that? Well, what if I really don't want to do that? And it's like, well, that kind of sucks, and, and we have this little debate. Um, and then I just do it anyway. But, you know, um, I feel like, you know, I get to have my wine, and and then I just move on and, and do whatever that right. is. Mm-hmm. Well, the key is in the end that you do it. You know, I mean, obviously, if it's something we need to help with the higher, it's something we're still learning. So there's probably going to be a little back and forth. And it sounds like you're very interested in reincarnation. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, oh. Yeah, but I think that's the part where a lot of people get stuck. Right. Well, they get this message one. that says they're supposed to be doing this, and they're like, well, I don't want to do that. And then they don't. Well, exactly. Then they'll feel the, p- the pains of it not working out properly. And then that will uh, kind of, they'll suffer the consequences. But the key is, see, we get, um, the ego gets involved. Let's let's be honest here. Um, You know, we think we're so smart we can figure it all out ourselves. And we have to realize that our whole experience on earth is a cooperation with the higher. It's a cooperative process. We didn't put ourselves on this earth. Okay, we were put on this earth. So we're part of something that's bigger than just us. And, you know, we're kind of coming out of a me generation, you know, where everything's about me, 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 and what do I want. And, other, and in a way, we really have to grow up out of that a little bit. Of course, the divine me is extremely important, the, the, the divine spark that's within us. But the persona that keeps thinking it can figure out all its problems on its own, that's a different story. So like you said, surrender sounds like a defeat. Oh, you know, the, the, the losing army has to surrender when the... No, no, but that's not what's meant when it's in the divine nature. Surrender means opening, like you just said, opening up to the higher and inviting the higher into your life and letting it be a cooperative process in the decision-making. And as this happens, but we have to realize this, we're not opening up to Joe Schmo over there, you know, we're opening up to a greater intelligence than ourselves. And some people, that's a hard thing to contemplate. 
something smarter than that, <laughs> you know, in a sense. <laughs> and to realize, you know, that's how I learn. But, you know, a child will look up. You know, that's what I say. You have to be almost like a little child to enter that kingdom of heaven, meaning you have to have that sense of wonderment and that sense, not naivete, but that sense of willing to just be in it, be in it and let it envelop you kind of like a rapture. And, you know, there's been a lot of romance in the Indian descriptions of the divine experience as kind of a rapturous experience. And there's an element of truth there because when you're working with the higher, it's an exciting experience because you're working with the divine. You know, right now we're working on our next book on uh, the spiritual hierarchy. And uh, uh, one of the things that's just so strongly coming out, how we're completely, you know, kind of in their hands. We may not see them right now, but they're completely, they're, they're so involved in our life in so many ways and in loving ways. It's a wonderful cooperation. And we're the ones that keep shutting the door. You know, years ago when I, I had first met Barbara, I gave her a, uh, I gave a couple I knew a uh, double reading, you know, with Barbara doing the aura and everything. And uh, the, the wife was extremely open and receptive and got a lot out of the session. The husband was extremely skeptical and was trying to see if Barbara was looking around for pictures to try to pick up things about him. I mean, you know, and afterwards, you know, it was clear one session went well, the other maybe not quite as well. Um, and uh, I asked, well, she was saying I, well, I could really see it in his aura. So I was asking her, well, how did you see it in his aura? I said, well, there was a, like a gray cloud of skepticism above his head. And it was literally kind of blocking the flow of the connection of the higher coming down. So we create our own darkness. And then, of course, it's hard to see. It's hard to understand. Then we cry out, why can't I understand? So like you say, we say, why don't I know my purpose? Why can't I figure it out? And then when the higher tries to help, we say, oh, forget it. I'll figure it out by myself. You know. So again, you, can't have, you have to decide which way you're going to go. But eventually, all of us have to learn to work with the higher. And every great mystic, every great prophet, every great sage always has said, this is, this is, not, a, this is not just me. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a presence and an intelligence and a power that flows through. And that's the truth for all of us. We're all channels of the divine as we open up. Now, you know, they say um, Edison used to have his ear, and we're not on a on video right now, but he would have his hand up to his ear like he was trying to hear somebody. And it was almost like a habit of his. So he got into this habit of listening, even though there was nobody there, but listening to what? His inspiration. So that and artists know this too. When the muse, quote-unquote, hits, it's not intellectual, it's not somebody talking, it's just something out of the creative ether is suddenly striking them, and they learn to respect that. And the minute that happens, they don't question it, they act on it. You know, uh, Ludwig van Beethoven, the great composer, they'd say you'd be having lunch with him, and suddenly his eyes would go wild. He got some great idea for a symphony, and he'd say, lunch over, goodbye, i got to go. Or he'd be in the <laughs> middle of a, of, a, of a piano lesson with somebody, the eyes would go wild again. The inspiration would strike. He'd say, lesson over, bye. He learned to respect when the inspiration spoke to him. So we have to do that too because God speaks to every one of us. But we do, like you say, we have to listen to it, and then we have to act on it. And if we choose not to act, is that how we begin to create karma? And Absolutely. just to give you a heads up, we have five minutes till a break, so let's just kind of introduce the concept of karma, and then when we come back, we can really get into the meat of it. The meat of it, huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, to wrap it up again, karma is the law of cause and effect. What you sow, you do reap. And everything we're doing is creating some type of an effect. Um, with our, our thoughts, our words, our actions, we're, con we're creative beings. So everything is creating an effect. The goal is to simply learn how to create more beautiful things in our life, more positive, more creative, and also to reclaim some of the beautiful effects from our past that we have done that maybe have not fully reclaimed. 
and to work out any of the imperfections, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative. There's personal karma, there's rural karma, there's national karma. So uh, karma fit goes to everything. It's a, uh, I guess the law of karma, that's the way it works. Yeah. So what we'll, we'll try to look at here though, one of the things we really encourage people is to face their karma. And we'll look at some of the situations to try to recognize karmic conditions that might be going on in your life and to to learn to recognize them. What do we do when we're faced with them? The old expression, why do bad things happen to good people? That kind of thing. Why was I born into a family of poverty and this kind of stuff? Instead of feeling like a victim of our life, these things have happened to us, to realize they're part of a larger picture and to take our own responsibility here and not be the victim but the master of our own life. Now, karma always finds us no matter what. <laughs> we don't have to look for it. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> <laughs> that old time karma. <laughs> I used to joke around with my son. He had instant karma. I'll tell you what, just instant <laughs> karma. Do something stupid, and karma would come and kick him in the butt. You know, add a little bad behavior, and boom, instant karma. He would go and be mean to his brother, and he would turn around and, like, walk into a cabinet. I mean, it was just <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it was a instant. friend of mine, and uh, she always had problems with her bosses, so she had karma with every boss that she encountered. <laughs> So it, it will find you, that's or, for sure. Or karma in the workplace. We'll talk. That's actually one of the signposts of karma. If you notice that whatever you do, you find yourself in the same situation again, time and time. You know, oh, the, the problem is my boss over here. But then I go to another job, it's the same problem, different boss. And you go to a third time, it's the same thing. Or people that, you know, constantly date, quote, unquote, the wrong person. Uh, after a while, you start to say, well, wait a minute. These just can't all be the wrong people. There's something else going on here. So let's try to look at it a little deeper. What maybe am I doing to contribute to the situation? Well, in a way, it's good to have karma because that's the way we evolve. Right, because ultimately karma, karma is a teacher, and that's going to be the, the centerpiece of all of it. It's teaching us something, and as we learn that something, we become better. Uh, it's, it's really interesting when we're doing the we do the classes and the workshops on this. I think of all the of all the different things. On the, oh, there, there, there. Sorry. <laughs> um, we need to take another quick break. I'm Dr. Rita Louise. We're here talking with Barbara Martin and Dimitri Moraitis. Uh, their book is Karma and Reincarnation. Their website spiritualarts.org. We'll be back after these words from our sponsors. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. 